Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for uh, for joining with us again. And, and we're gathering this morning, as was uh, as Jonathan mentioned, we're gathering this morning in our in our fourth session um, in Philippians. We're still in chapter one. Uh, we're not even going to finish chapter one today. Uh, God has much to teach us through this wonderful book, but we are going to look at um, at verse eighteen of chapter one through to verse twenty six. Uh, and again, even there, uh, we see so much riches and truth that I would encourage you to spend uh, a lot of time in. And um, so far in this series, we, we've thought about how God is showing us what it means to have deep roots of a joyful faith, deep roots of a joyful faith. And hopefully that's been clear in chapter one up until now. And certainly as we continue through the book, we're going to see that time and time and time again, how we can have deep roots of joyful faith. Uh, and today, in, in our short passage in this second half of chapter one, we're going we're gonna to see joy once again. Uh, if you've got your Bible open, you'll see it, first of all, in, in verse 18. Uh, we, we did the first half of verse 18 last week, and the second half of verse 18 starts with, yes, I will continue to rejoice. Paul, again, is on this theme of joy. And, and our passage today in verse 26 is going to end again by thinking, uh, sorry, in verse 25, where Paul is talking about the progress and joy in the faith of the Philippian church. Joy is still at the heart of what uh, God is saying to us through the pen of the Apostle Paul here. And it's, it's, there's something, as we think about joy, there's something striking about the rest of this passage. Jack has already prayed uh, one verse that we are going to see here, um, that, that in the middle of this theme of joy, we also encounter uh, some of Paul's talking and God's teaching on death. And so in verse 21, we see one of possibly one of the well, most well-known verses of Philippians, that for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so we hear Paul speaking about joy, but also speaking about death. Can, can that be, can those two things go hand in hand? I mean, doesn't, doesn't, Death brings sadness and pain and loss and grief. Well, yes, absolutely it does. However, as we've been saying throughout this series so far, this biblical understanding of joy, which is expressed through this book and in lots of other places, that, that biblical understanding of joy is not talking about an emotional response to our circumstances. That's happiness. Or, of course, it can be joy. We can experience joy in the moment but the kind of biblical joy that's being spoken of throughout Philippians, throughout Scripture, is indeed this conscious reliance on someone beyond ourselves who holds our every circumstance in his hands. And therefore, there is true joy when we trust in him because we know that he is holding our every circumstance in his trustworthy hands. True joy we have seen and we will continue to see is found in Jesus Christ the one who holds our life's lives in his hands. And through all that we'll see today, that's one of the reasons we will see Paul expressing to live is Christ, to die is gain. And in either of those circumstances, there's joy in Christ Jesus. Uh, and so our passage today, we're, we're also going to see w what difference this kind of joy makes to our outlook in life, indeed our outlook on death. And so he shows that by by demonstrating what I'm going to call a joyous confidence. A joyous confidence. That's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. And we're going to see that in four ways as we read through this passage. But let's do that. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, we're going to pick it up in the second half of verse 18 uh, and read through to verse 26. If you have a copy of God's Word, please turn there. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, then lift one of those hardback red uh, Bibles. Um, and if you don't have a Bible at home, please take that as our gift to you uh, so that you have a copy of God's Scripture with you. So let's begin. Philippians chapter 1, verse 18, the second half of, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, Paul goes on, for, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. 
Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Such wonders that God has for us here. Let's, let's pray and ask for his help. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through it. And I pray now that as we meditate on your word, you would show us more of yourself. And Father, that you would equip us to live for you. In your glorious name we pray. Amen. So Paul, once again, is writing on this theme, this, this heartbeat of joy. And he's writing, as we saw last week, he's writing from prison likely facing imminent judgment from Caesar as to whether he should face death, the death penalty or not. And yet, in all of that context, he displays this joyous confidence in the face of whatever circumstances he presently had. But, but I wonder, as we read through that, and maybe as you glance back over those verses, I wonder, did you notice the number of times Paul mentions Christ, or Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ? Five times I counted in this short block. And why is that significant? Why is that significant? Well, it shows us how Paul is able to have this joyous confidence. It shows us where Paul's confidence is placed. See, Paul can demonstrate this joyful confidence because his confidence is not in his ability. It's not in the churches in Rome or Philippi who can offer help. His confidence is not in Caesar as, as the one who has, has the authority to, to declare life or death over him in some kind of final way. No, Paul's confidence is in Jesus Christ. And therefore, Paul's confidence in whatever circumstances can be joyous because he knows who Christ is. And that might sound a little bit like an echo from last week, and it should, because last week we saw how Paul was able to thrive in these circumstances of house arrest in Rome, yet he was able to maintain this gospel focus This passion for Christ and for Christ to be preached. And that then enabled a joyful faith in any and every circumstance. And we broke off right in the middle of verse 18 last week where we say that Paul, in the midst of everything, explained, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And then he goes on. He didn't have a week's gap. And the Philippians who heard this didn't have a week's gap before they followed on with. And yes, I will continue to rejoice for. And so that little for at the start of verse 19. We're going to see now what Paul's joy is based on. Yes, I will continue to rejoice for. What, what is the foundation of Paul's joyous confidence in every and in, in all in every circumstance? Well, we're going to see, as I said, at least four things here. And that I believe God would have us look at. Paul can display this joyous confidence in God's plan. This joyous confidence in his life's goal. This joyous confidence in his secure future. And joyous confidence in his present purpose. Those are at least four of the things that we see here. Among the many things that God has to teach us. So let, let let me explain what I mean by how Paul displays joyous confidence in God's plan. Look with me again at verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. That that, that last phrase is interesting, isn't it? Remember Paul, strapped, chained to a Roman soldier, yet he speaks of his deliverance. And he used that phrase, what has happened to me? He used that again in verse 12, speaking of imprisonment. He said then, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And now he says, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. How can, how can being chained in Rome be for your deliverance, Paul? Well, Paul's able to say that because, as he explains, the prayers of God's people and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. In other words, Paul knows that in the midst of all that is going on, God is at work. God's people are praying. God's Spirit has been given. Therefore, in every circumstance, God is with Paul and God is actively involved in what is going on, even if Paul can't see it there and then. And the same is true for us. That because of the prayers of God's people, because of the the provision of God's spirit, we can know that God does not leave us in our circumstances. He is with us 
there. And therefore, we can have joyous confidence that he is doing something. He is working out his plans. But, but what does Paul mean by deliverance? Well, if you're reading along in the NIV, you'll maybe see that there's a, a, note, a footnote here connected with that word that can mean either vindication or salvation. So, so is Paul suggesting here that because he knows God is with him, that God will then vindicate him in the Roman courts? Does it mean that, that God will, will save him from the potential of, of Roman execution? In, in essence, is Paul suggesting that God's involvement mean that his circumstances are going to improve? Is that what he means by being delivered, being vindicated, being saved? Well, I think Paul would certainly say that God's involvement makes things better, but maybe not in those tangible physical ways that we would expect, those circumstantial ways where we could look and say, oh yes, I can categorically see that your circumstances changed to a better way, therefore God must have been involved in that. No, Paul's not suggesting that. Paul knows that his imprisonment served to advance the gospel. He knows that to follow Christ means being prepared to suffer. We're going to see that the next time we encounter um, Philippians. When we look at the last couple of verses of chapter 1, we see it again in chapter 2, verse 17. Again in chapter 3, verse 8, 9, and 10. Paul knows that to follow Jesus means to suffer. He knows that faithfulness to Christ means letting go of anything else. And so he knows all that. He knows the cost of following Christ. And yet, as he writes elsewhere in Romans 8, 28, he knows that God works for good. Or God works all things for good for those who love him. So, so how do we understand this? What is God showing us here? Does following Jesus help in those moments of struggle and trial? I believe Paul would shout, yes, Jesus does matter. Jesus is the only one indeed who can matter when we struggle. He's the only one who can make a difference. And that's because Paul knew that whatever would happen to him, whether he would be freed from prison or whether he would be executed for following Jesus. Whatever happened, God was working out his plans. And God's plans were good. Whether that meant life for Paul or death, God's plans were good. Whether that meant being praised by others or being the subject of scorn, God's plans were good. And Paul, therefore, could have joyous confidence in them not in the circumstances that he faced. And so that's what I think Paul is meaning by the reality of God delivering him. He would deliver him in that eternal sense, in that spiritual sense, in that, therefore, that lasting true sense. Paul would know the deliverance of God. Indeed, he he has already known his salvation. You see, as as we come to see in a moment, Paul knew that his future was secure with Christ. And so, what did his current circumstances matter? In the scheme of God, of Paul's mind, he knew that his future was secure. So whether by life or by death, God's plans are good. By freedom or execution, God's plans are good. Because he knew the plans of God meant eternal presence with him in glory. And therefore, he was able to know that the fullest and richest sense of freedom, of deliverance, that's what that is. And he knew that that was only found in Jesus Christ. And so, all of that means that Paul, and indeed all of us who follow Christ today, means we can know a joyous confidence in God's plans, because his plans, as we've seen earlier from 1 Peter, God's plans end well for those who are in Christ. There is no greater end than what is coming for those who follow Jesus. And so therefore we can trust him and that makes an immense difference to the way that we live our day-to-day life. And Paul demonstrates the immense difference it makes in our day-to-day life in in what I'm claiming as our second point here, that that Paul has a joyous confidence in his life's goal in verse 20. And whatever is going on, listen to what Paul says, verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always... Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You see how those are linked? That Paul is so joyously confident in God's eternal plans that he is therefore confidently living out the clear goal of exalting Christ. He he knows that for eternity, he he will spend his eternity exalting Christ. And so let his life be about that now. That's his sole focus, whether by life or by death, that Christ would be exalted in my body. 
And therefore, his desire in his present circumstances chained in Rome would be that Christ would be exalted, that he would point others to Christ, that he would make much of Christ in his circumstances. That's his goal. And whatever circumstances, therefore, come his way, Paul will be actively using those circumstances to glorify Christ, whether by life or by death. And I suppose we could look at this and say, yeah, well, staring down the barrel of a potential death sentence would would certainly sharpen the focus of what you would want your life to be about. But Paul hasn't just been like this in the letter to the Philippians as that sentence is coming. No, this is the way Paul lived his life. This was the, 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 the encouragement and the attitude that he showed to every Christian around Asia Minor in all his missionary endeavors to live to glorify Christ. That's what life's about. We're going to see that. In fact, even as if, you're, if your NIV has the title for the next session, Live Worthy of the Gospel, this is part of Paul's heartbeat. This is what it means to follow Jesus. This is not just a belief thing. This is an active belief thing. And so in every way and in any way, Paul wants to exalt Christ. Even if that means death for him. And that's challenging, isn't it? Because... There are many things in life that that vie for our attention. There are many things that that seek to take priority in our life. And many of them good things. Many of them good gifts from God. But when they get in the way of exalting Christ in our lives, then the example from Paul here would say that surely we must lay them down to exalt him. And that's the command of scripture. And, And it may cause sacrifice from us. But as Paul continues to unpack through this letter, there is no greater way to live than by fully committing ourselves to Jesus Christ. By laying ourselves completely at his feet. And the reason there's no better way to live, even despite whatever sacrifices that may bring, is because there is nothing of more eternal value than Christ himself. And so all of these other things that vie for our attention and may be good things, they, they might provide an element of the joy that we crave, but only a life fully devoted to Jesus Christ in the way that Paul lives here can know that deep, abiding, lasting, eternal joy of a life joyously confident in God's plans and joyously confident in his life's goal to exalt him. And and knowing that, knowing that we find that a challenge, knowing that that laying down those things to keeping ourselves gospel focused, as we saw last week, to to lay everything else down, to fully invest and to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. I, I find it so encouraging that God, through Paul, explains in this verse that we will need, and Paul therefore asks for sufficient courage to exalt Christ in everything that we do. Did you notice that? His hope I eagerly expect and hope that I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted. Not only is that sufficient courage to make a stand that Paul may have to make, but courage indeed to make those daily choices to exalt Christ. Because the reality is a, a life devoted to exalting Jesus Christ requires courage because it runs contrary to the life of least resistance to the world around us and to our own desires. So so the the easy life, if I can put it like that, the life of least resistance is just to go with the flow. Whether that is the world around us flow or our own desires flow. But the life very often that Jesus calls us to, he calls us to run contrary to that. And therefore we need courage. And God provides courage. God provides his spirit that enables us to live that life of faithful obedience to him. And so may the goal of our lives be equally focused as Paul's was to exalt Christ in all that we do. In any way, in every way, let's exalt Christ. The third thing that we see here is is Paul's joyous confidence in his secure future. We see this in verse 21 and again in verse 23. Paul therefore says in verse uh, 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he explains at the end of verse uh, 23, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And these are remarkable things to say, I think. To live as Christ, to die as gain. To be with Christ is better by far. 
per- perhaps we hear them and, and can agree with the sentiment of what Paul's saying, but maybe think that he's exaggerating a bit. All right, Paul, we get it. Rhetorical, yeah, I, I understand. You're making, a, you're making an argument there, so let's be hyperbolic about it. I don't, I don't see that in the example of Paul. I just see this as his exact way of living. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Being with Christ is better by far, whatever I face. Well, then my question is, well, Paul, how can you be sure of that? How can you have joyous confidence in what awaits you? Well, I think it's demonstrated by the way he lives his life now. As one commentator has said, that even though Paul throws himself with abandon into the life in the present, the entire orientation of his life is toward the absolutely certain future that he has. And so therefore, because he's so focused on what he knows Christ has got for him in the future, then his life is lived in light of that. Paul is so completely confident in that future. His whole life is therefore directed to live as Christ would live. Indeed, to live is Christ, he says. There's nothing else for Paul. Life is Christ. Everything he does is for Christ, because of Christ, to Christ, from Christ. Life is Christ for Paul. And therefore, death, which is not the end for the Apostle Paul, it's not the end for any believer in Jesus Christ, Death, in fact, is the entry into the very presence of the Lord and Savior we serve. Therefore, death is gain. Life is Christ, so death, which takes me to him, is gain. And so for Paul, his whole life is about Christ, and therefore eternity with him is better, better by far. And I find that at the same time uplifting, yet deeply, deeply challenging. Because if I'm honest, there are things about this life that I value. There are things in this life that I find delight in. There are things that are good in this life. Good gifts, as I said earlier. Good gifts that God gives. These are gracious things from the hand of our Heavenly Father. Yet I wonder at times, have I let the gifts take priority over the giver? I've I've come to value the gifts he's given. And therefore, the value that I place on him is diminished. Therefore, when it comes to me writing a a sentence like this, would I say to live is Christ, to die is gain? Or would I say to live is great, to die is going to be loss? Would I say to be with Christ is better and better by far? Have we let some of the things that God has graciously given us become a God in themselves, small g? That, that job, that house, that relationship, that family, that salary. These are good things that God gives us. But have they taken the place of God himself in our lives? Because the reality is that, that, that when each of us encounter death, which we all inevitably will, then many of these things don't go with us. And so we, when we stand face to face with our loving Heavenly Father, surely we'll recognize that he deserved so much more of the affection and the attention that we gave him when we were here because he is infinitely worth more than anything that we've valued in this life. That's what makes death gain. God himself makes death gain. Entering into the fullness of his presence is gain. It is better by far. And with that attitude, And to live is Christ, because to die is gain. Everything I'm about now is for him. Oh, may he help us to do just that. Paul goes on now to to talk in these next few verses a bit about death. And I know that death is an uncomfortable subject for many of us, a painful subject for some of us indeed. Um, But Paul doesn't seem to, to display that attitude here anyway. In fact, it seems like death is something that Paul is excited about. I desire to depart He's looking forward to that day. Uh, And I think he's able to do that because of everything that we've seen before, that there's this excited anticipation because his whole life is about Christ. Whereas, as I mentioned, some of us look ahead to death and fear the losses that it may bring. Now, of course, for those who have lost, those of us who have lost loved ones, of course, there is loss in death. We feel that loss. We sense that loss. We know that grief. There's a weight 
that comes with death. Of course not. I'm not making light of that. Scripture doesn't make light of that. But Paul's example here shows us that a life lived in joyous confidence in our secure future means that there's nothing to fear in death. For the Christian, it is not the end. Indeed, it is the doorway into the very, phys- the very tangible physical presence of Christ himself. One author puts it this way, the grave is not sovereign, but only a servant to bring us to Christ. Now, of course, we live in the presence of Christ now by his spirit. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about the very physical presence of being with him himself. So death is not, the grave is not sovereign. It does not control us. No, it is a servant to bring us to Christ. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? You see, the reality is if we grasp that truth, if we can confidently say that with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, then we know we can say that because Christ is our ultimate treasure. He is the one we value more than any. Therefore, we know that he has secured our future. Therefore, our future is better by far because he is there. So Paul is demonstrating here this joyous confidence in a secure future. And the last thing that we'll mention is in verse 22 to 26. This joyous confidence that Paul has in his present purpose. And I love this section because it gives us an insight into this internal dialogue that's going on in Paul's mind. He welcomes the Philippians into that dialogue and therefore God in preserving this in his word has welcomed us all into this dialogue as to how Paul is thinking about death and how that, that, that torn, that tearing that he's explaining of longing to be with Christ yet knowing that God has something for him now to do. Because there, there, is, a, there is a wrong way to understand Paul's heavenly focus. So to live as Christ, to die as gain, does that mean that Paul just lived with his head in the clouds and was of no earthly value? Not at all. No, not at all. Paul knew that he was not just filling time here in the time that he had left that God granted him. No, let's read verse 22 to 26 to see what God will show us here about how we should live our lives now. So verse 22, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. See, Paul is torn. He knows that he can be useful for the gospel if he remains, yet he knows that to be with Christ is better by far. And it's a, it's, a, it's a helpful reminder for us that although our secure future awaits, for the time that God gives us here, he has fruitful labor for us to be engaged with. So, so what is Paul's present purpose? What is he to be about? Well, interestingly, Paul shows that part of his purpose here is to, is to help the progress and joy in the faith of the Philippian Christians. Uh, And this is a living example of the humble service that we'll come to see in chapter 2. That that essentially Paul is saying here that even though it would be better for him personally to go and be with Christ. He knows that it would be that God has much for him to do corporately. To ensure that others are built up in their faith and in their joy in Christ. And not only does Paul know that to be the reality, he then joyfully accepts that to be the present purpose God has for him. See that convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So Paul willingly and sacrificially serves his brothers and sisters to seek to help them and develop their walk with Christ, their discipleship of Jesus. And it's a, it's a wonderful example for us to emulate, isn't it? To be so joyously confident in God's plans. Joyously confident in our life's purpose to exalt Christ. Joyously confident in the future that awaits us. That we are then joyously confident in the present purpose that we have. Of sharing Christ with those around us and encouraging and uplifting our brothers and sisters. And all of that is done so that our boasting in Christ Jesus would abound. So Paul here is living this life of joy. 
this life of joyous confidence that, that undergirds the life of Paul and indeed the life of all of us who claim Christ as our Lord and Savior. That we can trust in God's plans. We can live to exalt him. We can be secure in the future that he has won for us. And we can joyfully and sacrificially serve God wherever he has called us to be with that present purpose. Isn't this good news? Our, our life is not, is not without value. Our life has a very clear purpose. God has placed us here where we are to enjoy him forever. And until we reach glory, until we are taken to that place where we stand face to face with him, he has fruitful labor for us to do. And yes, living that life of exalting Christ means, it can mean hardship, it can mean suffering, it can mean sacrifice. But it is joyful because we know that our life is not contained with the, the time that we have on this planet. We will spend eternity exalting Christ. So let's get good at it now, if I can put it in that rather crass way. That is, that is our future that awaits us. So let's live our lives to glorify him in everything that we do and have that joyous confidence as we do. Oh, our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you have shown us what it means to be joyful in you. Not a, not a, kind of superficial, happy, clappy, empty emotion. Although, Father, you do warm our hearts and lift our hearts. And we praise you for that. But, Lord, the joy that you give, it runs deep into our very souls. So that in everything that we do, whatever circumstances we face, we want to live our lives to exalt you, knowing that you have a plan for our life which is good, knowing that that plan leads to an eternity with you, knowing that that plan is about exalting you in all that we do. And therefore, Father, we want to presently be about what you would have us do. And Lord, in all of that, we recognize that we need your help. Father, would you forgive us for the times that we get distracted? Would you forgive us for the times that we, that we put other things on the throne of our lives other than you? Things that may seem good, but are not eternal. Things that indeed you may give us. And yet, Father, somehow we, have, we worship the gifts rather than the giver. Oh, Lord, would you forgive us, we pray. Help us, God, to nurture that affection and that deep desire to love you and grow in our love for you. And as you do that, Father, may our lives then be about exalting you in every and any circumstance we find ourselves in. Thank you that you give your spirit to enable us and equip us. And we pray that our lives would indeed be about honoring you, glorifying you. And Father, um, personally, as individuals scattered then throughout the week, and then corporately, would we encourage one another? Would we spur one another on? Would you be the focus of our, of our glory and our exaltation? Because you alone are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You alone deserve the praise. And so would you receive it from our lives, we pray. Amen.